So welcome to incorporating phonics and fluency materials into any instructional material. Uh, Janet is our facilitator and you'll hear about her in just a few moments. Next. So during this webinar, if you uh, would like to introduce yourself or share links and resources with the group, please use that chat feature. For the Q&A, any questions about the content for the facilitator can be added to the Q&A. Uh, questions will be either answered by the presenter uh, during the Q&A session or by pro-literacy staff. If you have a technical problem, please raise your hand and someone from pro-literacy will be here to help you. And if you need captions, please make sure you click that show caption button at the bottom. Yes, we are recording. Yes, we are recording. Uh, you will you will receive a follow-up email with the links to the recording, the PowerPoint, the certificate of attendance, the chat and Q&A transcripts, any membership information and scholarship information. An exciting job embedded opportunity is um, upon us at the end of the uh, at the end of the session, Janet will share a little bit more about her small group workshop sessions. These workshops are an opportunity to expand on the topic from the webinar and for you to apply the content, the content to your own context. They pl take place about a week following the webinar. There's limited seats, so please make sure you register. It gives you an opportunity to meet with Janet and talk to her about applying these concepts in a job embedded way to your particular content. Also, you can ask any question you need to. Um, uh, in the chat, Danielle added the dates of the upcoming webinars and those topics. We look forward to seeing you there. And as you can see, those are the three topics. They're October 30th, the 31st, and November 1st. You and can register. Be, yeah, there's QR codes to register later. Yes, and you can register for all of them. So you don't have to just stick with one. Go ahead. Additional resources we have available to you. We have a scholarship of $1,000 in New Readers Press materials. If your organization has not already applied for that scholarship, it is limited. Please make sure you click the link in the chat. And of course, as a participant, you get a free one-year membership for participating in a TTP webinar, Teacher Training Plus webinar. Please make sure you click that link in the chat. And of course, it's election season, so make sure your students are ready to vote and learn about voting. We have a free interactive voting guide from Pro Literacy and the easy to read weekly newspaper, News For You. Please make sure you take a look. It explains who can vote and why every vote counts. It describes how we pick leaders and tell students in a nonpartisan way how to register to vote and where to cast their ballot. There's more information in the chat box. And now I'll hand it over to Janet. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Maribel. Thank you, Danielle, for the magic behind the scenes. So um, I have been teaching uh, low literacy ABE students to read better for over 24 years, ABE, adult basic education, native English speakers. Uh, I've been training tutors almost as long. This is my second year as a teacher training plus presenter. And in addition, I've presented at multiple state and national conferences, and I thought that was important enough to say twice. Sorry about that. Um, and I was just honored at the Pro Literacy Conference a couple of weeks ago. Seems like it's been years, but a couple of weeks ago with the um, Dollar General Literacy Innovator Award. So that was very exciting. So what I'm going to do at this point is um, just to save on bandwidth and all that fun stuff, I'm going to turn my video off. 
um, because I'll be looking at two screens and that way I'm not distracting to anybody. So you know a little bit about me. I'm also located in Richmond, Virginia at the Reed Center. Um, let's find out about you. So just like our students are always learning new or reviewing something they already know, it is your turn. Um, if you move your mouse around, you'll get the bar at the bottom that pops up where your audio and video and things are. And if you click on annotate, which is the little pencil looking thing, you'll get a little pop-up bar that looks like what's in the circle. If you don't have that annotate button when you move around, it's possible it's up at the top of your screen next to the three dots next to either Maribel, Danielle's, or my name. So head to annotate and what you wanna do is click on the stamp. It's a check mark is the default one. And tell me about you. If you're an instructor, put a little stamp mark over in the instructor. If you are some uh, role other than instructor, then click over on the other side of the bar. Um, so, and I'm kind of confused because my check mark's not showing. So Maribel, hopefully you can share some information. Oh, I see a star right on the line for somebody who does both. It's what I'm guessing. Yours, so Janet, might be on the left-hand side of your screen. It might have popped upward on the left-hand side. Your, but my uh, check mark isn't showing and the star that somebody put right on the bar is not. Are you seeing that star? Yes. Yes, oh, we are. Okay. Okay. So anybody else? Shy bashful group. We got some hand raisings. Um, so once again, it's the annotate at the bottom. And when you click on the annotate, then click on the check mark and then click anywhere on what side of the board you are. Janet, I'm seeing a lot of people can't annotate and it may be because they have the version that Maribel explained that it's not what you showed, but it actually could be on the left-hand side of the screen. Ah, okay. So for all of you, then we're gonna, we're gonna pa practice patience and flexibility here, people. Um, in the chat, instructor or other? Let's get a feeling for how everyone is involved. If you're instructor, you can try instructor. If you're other, other, if you're both, put both. Okay, seeing a flash. Uh, pretty good fair amount of both are instructor, but we do have um, several um, both. Okay, next question for you. Are you and we'll just use the chat again. Are you a working in a small group or a class, or are you working one to one with a student? Student, if you are a instructor, so you can do small or one to one. And if you if you can annotate, you can put annotate on the board. Um, so small group or one-to-one. -one. Okay, small group, both one-to-ones, class, both. Okay, so we have a pretty good mix between class and one-to-one. -one. That helps um, with some things. It just helps me to know who I'm talking to. And our next question. Question, ooh, another online person. Yes, I teach online only. I do not teach in person anymore with my program except for training. All right, third question. Your student, the people you are teaching, are they native English speakers? They were, they were born and raised speaking English 
Or is English not their first language? So yes, if they're a native English speaker, um, and let's say no for not, if they are only, um, if English is a second, third, fourth, fifth language. Okay, we got some both, we got some native speakers. Okay, so we got a pretty good mix. Okay, very good. So, and remember, if you have questions as we go, use the um, Q&A button at the bottom to ask the questions. Daniela, hold on to them unless she sees one that is like, that definitely makes sense to stop right at that instant. What we're going to do today, we are going to know by the end of today how to add a additional phonics activities to any story or workbook, because face it, our students do not learn their vowels in one page. Um, we are going to be able to identify a section of a story or workbook and the type of fluency exercise that we can use with our student. And by the end of the workshop, I am hoping you are able to explain the focus of the three workshops next week because this is new. I'm gonna spend a little extra time on what we're gonna be doing in those three workshops. This that you are seeing on the screen are snapshots from Journey to Success Level One from New Readers Press. I teach ABE, native English speakers, journey to success is geared towards them. And I love it. Um, it's a newer series from New Readers Press. And what I liked and still like about it, um, you've got phonics in every chapter. You've got a vocabulary skill. You've got reading. You've got using the reading skill. You've got using the writing skill. You've got all kinds of exercises in this chapter. So it really gives a full four component plus writing aspect to reading, which is something I very much liked about it when I was in person. Um, I'm still waiting for the online version to come out. Um, and I've just given you a snapshot of lesson one and lesson two so that you can see the difference. So for example, lesson one, we're gonna learn our short vowels. And in lesson two, we're gonna learn to blend with R, L, and S. Um, I have never had a student master their short vowels in one chapter which is what has led to how can we make our material do double duty because we can't afford to keep going out and buying stuff. So what can we do with material we're already using with our students? This here is a little snippet from Journey to Success. It's a little warm up, read the sentence. It will be very hard to read on your screen or at least not too too, too comfortable depending on your screen size. Here is it printed larger. Um, what you will notice about this is, one, the font is slightly different. I changed this to be in the Lexend, L-E-X-E-N-D font. And that is a font that many dyslexics find easier to read. It has definitely proved true in my class. Um, and also the background is not bright white. It is, you can see there's the bright white and this has got just a hint of light blue or gray. My students are loving this. So if you have a student who is dyslexic and you have to print off, create and print off stuff for them, you might wanna consider those fonts. So here we've got our little story, not very long at all. What I wanna know 
And what I'm seeing and thinking is like, well, this is from chapter three. My students still haven't figured out this, all of the short vowels. So I'm thinking chapter one had short vowels. I'm in chapter three. I'm gonna ask my student to find all the words that have short vowels in them. And I'm gonna ask them to underline, circle, start, whatever works for your student. So take a minute and go through and think about the words and see what list you come up with with words that have a short vowel sound. So play a little Jeopardy thing. Do, 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 do. Take a look. What are we finding? Any short vowel at all? So, all right, Frank, A, not add like apple, A, so I wouldn't say Frank, but and, Mark, I'll see are there, Ark, drive to work each day, today, that's a long A, they, long A, are late, got a lot of long vowels and bossy R's in here, they jump, um, jump, in the uh, uh at the end. So it's actually a short vowel sound. I'm going to take it. Um, car, but it needs gas. They must stop at the, at that uh again, bank for cash. And I would have my student just go along and find as many of the short vowels as they can. Once again, I pick short vowels because that was covered in chapter one. My student is still trying to master them. Oh, look at this, I skipped next. Um, so, and just have them underline, and then you can go back and check and work on, is that truly a short A, or is that a, a funky sounding A because of the A and K, or is it long? Um, but that's an example of how you can take something you've already got and do something else with it. The... Throw in the chat, what other, what other ideas could we use this story for? So I gave the example of short vowel sounds or find all the words that have digraphs, um, like your TH is a digraph, um, because our students are all in different parts of their learning. So, what other ideas, use your chat, what other ideas do you have that we could use the, that little paragraph and have students look for some kind of phonics exercise? Our controlled vowels, I call those bossy R's, yep, rhymes. Lending. Oh, instead of looking for all phonic, all short vowels, find the words with short A and do it one at a time. Um, silent E to review that silent E spelling rule. Blends, silent letters. Ooh, I like that one. Long A, nasal blends. So we got a lot of ideas from that one little paragraph and 
I always find it harder to create stuff for the my very lowest level students than I do when I've got four, you know, 14 paragraphs of reading that my fourth grade equivalent students are working on. Um, and that's why I started with a tiny little thing. So he, the other ideas you can have, somebody mentioned rhyme. So you can either look for words that rhyme in the story or pick a word and have the student come up with as many words that rhyme with Frank, for example. You could pick word, a short word, and do your word families. You could do homonyms, homophones, homonyms, homophones, homophones, sound alike, spelled differently. Um, are there any of those in the story? So those are just some examples of things you can do with uh, phonics in a story. Now, I'm gonna move to a new story. This story is, you definitely is hard to read. This one is from readworks.org. It is a free website and it also includes question sets. So um, you can sign up as an instructor for free. You can create a class and sign your students up so they can do the work independently. It's got a lot of great resources in it. I picked a story about hurricanes and safety, which is actually a paired passage, Spanish and English. So one story is in English, one story is in Spanish. I know we have a lot of ELL people. Here is my paragraph that I pulled out of there, wrote it bigger. Um, this is roughly a third grade equivalent. Throw in the chat. Looking at this paragraph, what do you see that you might want to have your students work on from a phonics standpoint? What do you think? You know, think about your students. Think about what they're working on. Throw in the chat. What would you do to make um, be able to extend this already written material and use it for more learning. So let's see here. Yeah, reworks is great. Um, the O sound, ooh. Multi-syllabic words sounding out and or dividing by syllables. You could use that. Working on blends and identifying blends. Ooh, like this. Have them draw a picture that is comes from this paragraph. Great way to work on reading comprehension without them actually having to verbalize um, short versus long vowel sounds. Um, looking at map and reading the country names. Okay, so finding like finding your countries along the equator and have them work on reading those country names, syllabification, are controlled, root words with similar meanings, vowels. Oh, tons of great ideas. Tons of great ideas. And we, we so often get wrapped up in, this is my workbook, and so this is what I'm gonna do, and then, now, all of a sudden, you get done with class 20 minutes early. What do you do? Here is, this is why we're doing this. It's a perfect thing that you can do to either fill time if something went fast, or you just get more bang for the buck for that material that you're having to, you know, programs are buying or students are buying or however it's getting paid for. So fantastic ideas. Um, now, so we got this phonics part, and we're also going to talk about fluency. Fluency is reading smoothly and accurately with expression at a normal speaking pace. 
Because if our students are reading very choppy and there are pauses between words, their brain has no hope of understanding. And students need to learn how to read fluently. It's not just being able to say the words, but we have to build in that fluency and expression. Now there's sometimes you're working with a student and the material that you are working on is above their comfort reading level. So I've got this little chart here. And so we have our comfort reading level. If this is below the comfort reading level up to above the comfort reading level, that's your students. Down at the bottom, across the bottom, the type of reading you're going to do for fluency. And then we have the purple is the material reading level. So if I tried to use the equator story with my students reading at a K to first grade equivalent, they're not gonna be able to read anything in that solo. So I would pick one sentence from that paragraph and I would read it to them as they follow along. And then they would read it back to me. And we may practice that same sentence several times. But that's one way you can work with material. If you've got, if you're especially in a classroom, we all know there's times your material is too easy for some and too hard for others. So how to get a middle ground. If your, your material reading is below the student's comfort reading level, they can do a whole paragraph. So if I was to give my students reading at a third, fourth grade equivalent, this paragraph, which is at a roughly first grade equivalent, in theory, this is below their comfort level. And so I would still read the whole paragraph first, talk about the words the student may not know, like names. I never count names or proper nouns because they never follow the rules. Um, but we'll talk about those words. And then the student reads out loud. And as soon as the student, it's for my students, it's word endings. They hate word endings. So they're gonna add them, they're gonna take them off or they'll say um, something else like home for house. So the moment they make a mistake, I'll stop them and say, what was that again? And have them go back and read the word that's actually written um, and then have them read it one more time. It does, not only are we practicing fluency, but we're also practicing paying attention to what the author wrote. They are, the, your student is not the author, they don't get to change it. That author put a lot of time and effort in, let them have their glory, read what they wrote. Um, so that's an example for an entire paragraph below the student's reading level. So if you've got questions, put them in the Q&A and I'll wait for Danielle to um, uh, let me know if there are any questions. I've got a few. All and it's right. Mar oh, it's, it's Maribel. Maribel. Yep. Okay, Maribel, what do we got? All right, is AR a digraph? Ah, uh, I learned AR. So a digraph is two letters come together and make a completely different sound. I like to tell my students they're married and can never be divorced when dividing words. Digraphs are typically SH, CH, PH, WH, um, CK, and I'm missing TH, I think. AR would be either an R controlled vowel or 
I call them bossy R's because it helps my students understand the difference that R is so bossy. Not only is it not a closed syllable anymore, but I'm not gonna let you say a short vowel sound and I'm not gonna let you say a long vowel sound. You're gonna do something different. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few questions about the Lexend font. Is yes. that found on in Google and how do people get access to that? Ah, um, it is in Google Docs. So if you're using Google Docs, you are golden because it is a one of the 7 million default fonts. Um, Microsoft does not always have it. And the way I get around it <laughs> um, is like when I created, whoops, didn't have to go that far. When I created this slide, if I just copied and pasted the material in there, it's gonna come through um, one of Microsoft's default fonts. So what I did is I took the paragraph, copied it into a Google Doc, changed the font to Lexend, and then copied it and put it back in the PowerPoint and it kept the Lexend font. Very I cool. don't get it, but that's my workaround with Microsoft. But if you're if you're a Google person, you're golden. <laughs> so speaking of fonts, how important is the A shape with different fonts? Ah, so when our students are taught to read and write, they are taught that the very old school A that doesn't have the funny little cap on it, um, that's what they're taught to write. And I got to admit, I know very few people who even print the A with the funny little cap like you see here. I still give writing and teach using the funny looking A, as my students call it, because that's what they're going to see. So they just have to understand if you're printing with a pencil or pen, you do it this way. If it's typewritten, it's going to have that funny looking A. The same with the G. And they just have to learn the difference. Thank you. Um, another question, if you are meeting exclusively online, it can be hard to stop them in the middle of the reading when they make a mistake. Do you have any tips? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm forced with this every day, every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, first is to get them to teach them they need to listen for you. Uh, and sometimes they get so into that writing or that reading that they forget to listen for the teacher or tutor. Um, and I've had teach a couple of students with that. I've also, for one of my students who gets just so focused because he's in a busy background, he gets so focused, he blocks out conversation around him. I have a chime and I ding the chime and that gets through to him to let him know, okay, stop. And then I'll say, okay, let's go back here and look at this word. What was that word again? All right, now start at the start of the sentence and go. Great, one more question. Mm -hmm. How do you encourage a student to practice reading when they don't enjoy reading and struggle with many words? Ah, the age old question. Um, first thing I tell my students who are in that boat is I don't care what you read. Read stop signs or street signs, read a cereal box, um, read store signs. Anything, anytime you are looking at words and trying to figure them out, you are getting better with your reading, even if you don't feel like you are, because your eye is getting used to seeing those letters, those combinations. You may not understand what your that sign is. You may not be able to pronounce that word in the newspaper, but 
the fact that your brain is looking at something and trying to put it into a word is actually training and it's useful. Um, other options are um, if you subscribe to News For You online um, or Read Theory, uh, Read Works has um, an audio component so they can actually read the story and then play the story so they can see and hear. Excellent. So uh, shifting a little bit, uh, another person asked, you mentioned using a chime. Do you have a chime online or what do you use? I actually have a, a little chime um, that I, it's like a, a single silver bar with a little wooden mallet and I just hold it kind of near my computer and ding it and it's in loud enough it goes through the, uh, you know, through the computer. Great. Are there any other questions for Janet? Please feel free to drop them in the, in the Q and A. Okay. Now this, um, those two things, the phonics and the, um, fluency reading, the session on Wednesday, October 30th, this is a QR code to the sign up page. That workshop, we're going to start off, I'll do a little mini refresher, and then we're going to break into small groups and every group's going to have a different story. I'll have different levels. So if you're working with a fourth grade equivalent, I'll put you in a higher story versus a, somebody working with a kindergarten equivalent. In your small group, you're going to come up with an activity. We're going to come back together, share our ideas. So we're learning from each other, but you actually are creating the and finding the answers and so on. And then we'll do the exact same thing with the fluency. And we'll pick out and actually do a fluency reading to try it out. So the deeper dive is really you using the material and coming up with your answers. Okay, so that's the uh, Wednesday, October 30th from 3 to 4.30 session. Then, so remember I said I was going to make sure you hopefully explain so you could explain the difference between the three workshops. Um, has anybody seen Bloom's Taxonomy? You may also uh, have seen Webb's Depth of Knowledge. I like Bloom because it just clicks a little easier for me, but basically it is... Uh, it was created in 1956. It was revised in 2001. And it's used to help learners expand their learning beyond the basic, these are the rules. Um, and TABE and other assessments, are, it used to be you'd read a story and it said, Timmy had a red cap on and the question would be, what color cat is hat is Timmy wearing? Well, not anymore. The questions are getting much more complex, evolving a lot more critical thinking. And we need to prepare our students to um, be able to think along those lines. Um, so our second workshop, and I'm going to kind of go through this because I want to make sure our timing is good. Oops. Um, I'll come back to that. Our second workshop is expanding learning beyond those basic questions. So using fluent phonics, more phonics and fluency, but how can we expand the phonics learning using Bloom or Web or whoever 
to get more critical thinking in our students. We're also going to be including goal setting on that in that workshop. Uh, bonus points if anybody comes in costume on Halloween, October 31st. Um, but that's what the second workshop is about. We're also going to talk about accountability partners. So what are they? Just to, in the chat, who's got, how many people have accountability partners? Yes, no, I have no idea what you're talking about, Janet. Um, <laughs> Use the chat, let's get a feel for that. Who has an accountability partner? Yes, no, or what's that? Okay, we've got yeses, we've got noes, we've got what's that? Jessica, you and me, we were on the same page. You're, you will learn if you come on Wednesday or Thursday the 31st. We're gonna talk about these accountability partners and how they can actually help us to become better teachers. And there's now so many levels of teaching. There's just the teach a student to read, but now with the assessments and soft skills that employers are looking for, um, we have to include that critical thinking and people who have been in the field for a while it's a whole nother way of looking at it. People who are new to the field are like, oh my gosh, how do I put that in on top of everything else? So we will be talking about accountability partners also on Thursday. So does anybody have any questions about the um, Bloom's taxonomy and goal setting and the accountability partner workshop, which is next Thursday. Does Just everybody to, understand what I'm talking about? So one person did have a question about the, the news with the audio component. Mm -hmm. Which which resource was that? Um, if you have the news for you online subscription that yes. will read entire stories sentences or just a word or the read works that i have pulled one story from also has an audio component excellent um one person asked if the workshops will be recorded no we're not we don't record the workshops but we have three opportunities for you to engage with uh, Janet. And we're just yeah. not, we're not there. <laughs> so that's the second workshop is all about expanding that learning into critical thinking. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy is my preferred because it just clicks with my brain. Um, goal setting, accountability partners, all that piece of it. The third workshop, who does lesson planning? Does anybody sit and actually write a lesson plan for your class? Yes or no, not always. Ooh, we got a lot of people that write lesson plans. Very good. Okay. Um, not always, no. No, but I want to. Okay, Christina, hopefully I'll see you. Uh, <laughs> so with all this new material, it's like, how the heck do I make sure I get all of this into my lesson? And so the third workshop on Friday, November 1st is writing a lesson plan. Now, I'm going to present several different lesson plan formats in that workshop, and there's similarities between them. There's differences between them. And after, if you're in the workshop, you, you know, I'll, I'll be chatting you links to them. Um, we're going to pick 
work uh, topics that relate to phonics and fluency and actually come up with and write that part of the lesson plan so that we're actually doing something with phonics, we're actually doing something with fluency, and we're including that critical thinking, Bloom's taxonomy, that higher and higher stuff that we have to do. So that is what the um, November 1st workshop is about. The session, each workshop is an hour and a half. We're gonna start on time. We're gonna do a little, uh, just a small presentation before I send you all off into small groups. We come back together at the end of all three workshops are opportunities to just ask any other questions you've got. <laughs> okay, does anybody have any questions about the lesson planning part of the workshop, the third workshop? Nothing in the Q&A. Okay, so basically next week, three different workshops. Each workshop has a different focus. Each workshop will have an opportunity to answer those other random questions that pop up. Um, and so that learning can keep continuing. Um, what I want you to do, and this is so important, um, please, 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 please fill out the survey. I've got the QR code up on the screen. I had several people that made, asked questions or said, I wish it had, it would be even better if, I kept changing how I handled the workshops after the webinar to meet what the participants needed. So I really use these to be able to do a better learning experience for everybody. So please, please, please fill out the survey. Very important, very, very important. Um, a question that came through was yeah. about registering for the upcoming webinars. Yes. Um, how do they register? Oh, how do they register? Okay. So there's several different different ways. Um, hold that pin in that thought for just a minute. <laughs> So um, these are upcoming webinars from the Teacher Training Plus, very similar to what you're in now. Um, ELL, HSE, my next one will be vocabulary in writing, including vocabulary in writing. So very similar idea, just taking other components of reading. Um, and then the, so, when you get the slide deck, these will all be live links, or you can go to Pro Literacy's website to be able to register for these webinars. You will also get in that slide deck, these are links to the workshops. You will also, when you get the slide deck, that QR code for each session will take you to the sign up for that session. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Any other questions? So you can always get a hold of me at basic literacy at proliteracy.org. Um, and also I can just take random questions now, and hopefully I will also see you at the workshops where we actually dive in deeper and you folks do the work. So, any questions? 
no more questions in the in the q and a oh of course every time i say no more questions one pops up how do you keep your students motivated uh, <laughs> um yeah i mean i've had students who had been coming for 10 years when i met them um so motivation is big they have to see success if they don't see success just like we don't we want to lose 50 pounds if we don't see those first three pounds come off we're defeated that's the same way with our students they need to see success but you as a teacher need to break the skill into the tiniest little building block so that they can see, hey, you got your short A sound. Hey, you can tell the difference between a short A and a short O. Each one of those is a success. It's all in how small you break it down so that they have proven, yes, I do know that. Okay, cool, what's next? So keep those small, smart goals. Any others? How long on average does it take for someone to meet their literacy goals? Is it okay to take years to do so? I worry that the slow pace is my fault sometimes. Okay, so for that person that asked that question, is your student native English speaker or ELL? English is not their first language. ELL. Okay, there's a very important reason I asked that question. First off, I am not an ELL expert. I am not an ELL teacher. My only experience with ELL is moving to Germany and learning to speak German. So I know how students feel, but not how to teach them. Um, ELL, slow progress could be a multitude of things. Are they staying immersed in their home language at home? Or are they watching American TV or British TV? or listening to the radio. I recommend TV over radio because it's got visuals. Are they actually going out and trying to grocery shop in English? If they don't use the language, the progress will be so much slower. The, if that question was from uh, somebody else had the exact same question, but their student was um, a native English speaker. Yeah, it can take years because often uh, if a student is an adult and is a struggling reader, there is probably something else that is going on. Intellectual differences, cognitive differences, learning differences, and Sometimes it takes, and our students have a great coping skills. And sometimes it takes us as teachers a long time to figure out what their crutch is in order to take it away. So they have to start using their new skill. Um, so adults learning to read, yes. Especially if they're starting from K1 equivalent, it's a much slower progress. Your ELL people, it's all in how much do they get out there and use the English. Actually use it. Um, the more they use it, the faster and better their English will, will become. So like I used to watch German TV with English subtitles so that I could hear it but I, I could hear it in German, but see how it came across in, um, in English. So in German, instead of saying, I remember, it's, I remember to me. And that weird 
phrasing stuck with me. <laughs> so other questions? <laughs> 